It can feel selfish to do soul recovery. It can feel like you should be taking care of somebody else, like you should be doing for somebody else. And that this taking your time for yourself, this practice of turning the attention to yourself and doing your own healing feels like it's selfish. My name is Reverend Rachel Harrison, and this is the Recover Your Soul podcast, a spiritual path to a happy and healthy life. I started Recover Your Soul after having profound changes in my life from my recovery of alcoholism, control addiction, and codependency. I was guided to share the tools and principles of spirituality and soul recovery to help others transform their lives as mine was transformed. For us to overcome external circumstances, we must first turn the attention to ourselves, focusing on inner change. Positive results in our lives will follow. It can feel selfish to do soul recovery. It can feel like you should be taking care of somebody else, like you should be doing for somebody else. And that this taking your time for yourself This practice of turning the attention to yourself and doing your own healing feels like it's selfish. I totally understand because I think that I was taught for so long to be the caretaker, to be the peacemaker, to be the people pleaser, that when I really started on this journey of recovery, This was when things were not going well in our family. And when I stepped in the rooms of AA and I really realized that I needed to take care of myself finally, that if I didn't heal myself, that there was no other options for me, that I was going to completely fall apart. And then looking around at that time, five years ago, my family wasn't all that great. I have told the story in a recent podcast, but when I came back from that trip with Thailand with my mom and Rich picked me up from the airport with my mom and proceeded to start to complain about Alex and all the stuff that had happened three weeks I was gone and we ended up having this fight. And at that moment, I thought to myself, I can't do anything about this. I can't fix this. I'm exhausted from trying to fix it. And that I just spent three weeks without having any access really to what was going on with them. And I was fine that I could feel okay in myself, that I was doing the beginnings of my own work, that I got to just be present with myself And I realized at that moment how profoundly powerful it was that when I was away from the chaos, I actually was okay. I actually felt fine. I didn't have that pit in my stomach, that turn of what is going to break next, what's the next chaos, what shoe is going to drop, and that real need to just shove alcohol into me to make it so that I didn't have to feel those feelings. And even though I was detoxing when we were in Thailand, slowly but surely reducing the amount of alcohol I took into my body so that I could step on the ground and go into full sobriety, that whole trip, I really had an awareness of how I felt okay on the inside. And that helped me then to begin that part of soul recovery where I say, I need to do this for me. Now, interestingly enough, when I look at that five years ago compared to today, it's two totally different worlds. It's so completely different from how it was in all aspects in all aspects of myself, in all aspects of my communication with my husband, in the triangulation of my husband and my son and I, in terms of how my sons are doing. And it doesn't mean that life doesn't show up. I keep really wanting to impress upon this that it doesn't mean that when we do this work that all of a sudden there's no issues, that life doesn't continue to be complex. Life is complex. It never stops being complex. But there's something that happens when we put on our own oxygen mask, when we take care of ourselves first. I've heard this about a swimming pool and about lifeguards. And if you've had soul recovery coaching sessions with me, you may have heard me talk about this. But I think it's so powerful because 
I think I heard this story from Abraham Hicks, actually, and that her husband had been trained as a lifeguard, that the training was that if you are trying to save somebody and pools are and oceans are really scary, you know, people are drowning and that panic, of course, that happens when you're in that death moment where you literally are fighting for your life, you're terrified, right? And so this lifeguard jumps in and he goes to save the person and the person either allows themselves to be saved or they start to panic and they start to flail and they start to shove the person who is helping them down. And maybe the lifeguard has a buoy or whatever those things are called, but that has some flotation device to it. And they're trying to help them. They're trying to give them the flotation device. They're trying to do whatever they can to save them. And at some point, their life is in danger. And as the lifeguard, they are trained that they have to let that person go, that they have to be willing to save themselves. And if you have the life preserver, you leave them with the life preserver and they can decide, are they going to stop flailing? Are they going to trust? Are they going to calm down enough to allow themselves to save themselves? Or are they going to let themselves perish? And in the choice, the lifeguard has to choose to save themselves and they have to let that person drown. That's a powerful visual of what it's like in our lives when we're trying to fix and control the world around us, trying to fix and control the people around us, that at some point their story, their addiction, their life, their dysfunction, their whatever it is, their decision to be unhappy, you don't have to have someone in your life who's using, you can just have someone in your life who's stuck and who really doesn't want to get better, who doesn't want to be happy, who doesn't want to do the inner work. So many people are here because of the door of Al-Anon and addiction, but the truth is, it's bigger than that. Soul recovery is bigger than that. We all are affected by people in our lives who are choosing to not get well. And here we are, we're choosing to get well. We are the lifeguards, and we've given some effort, we've given some desire to help the people around us. And at some point, we have to be willing to say, I need to save myself. I need to save myself. I need to take care of my life. And that being drowned and being pushed down isn't viable anymore. It isn't acceptable anymore. So when I took that step, to stop drinking alcohol and went back into the rooms of AA, went back into the rooms of Al-Anon and really started to study spirituality, really decided that I wanted to be on this spiritual path to a happy and healthy life. And there's nothing like stepping into rooms when you are in crisis. There is so much support and so much wisdom and so much long-term and short-term sobriety, both in recovery and also in codependency, that helps us see that spectrum of the unhealthy, the desperate, the drowning. And then it helps us also to see the people who have come to the other side, who have gotten out of that drowning pool of life of whatever it is in their life, whatever the circumstances, and there's calm. And it gives us hope and it gives us inspiration. So when I stepped in those rooms, this time, it was different than the first time that I had gotten sober and done Al-Anon, because in the first time I did it, I really did it because I really wanted my husband to do it. And you've heard me say this so many times, but I really was controlling him. I wanted him to stop drinking. I wanted him to quit being an asshole. I was pretty sure I didn't have any of the character defects that it turns out that I have. Controlling being number one and fear being the other one, being so terrified by my feelings, so worried about the pain that was inside that I would do anything to cover up that pain, and also a real fear of failure that 
I had screwed up my life somehow that I'd screwed up my marriage and I'd screwed up my kids and I had so much shame over not living in the fantasy that I thought I was going to have when I stood there by the lake promising my love to my husband 29 years ago. At that moment, I was this young, naive 24-year-old that just thought it was going to be perfect and it wasn't perfect. It was hard. So taking care of ourselves feels selfish. It feels like I made this commitment to this relationship, or I'm in this family, or this is my friend, or this is my son, or this is my husband. And if I don't stay in the pool with them while they're flailing and drowning, I'm a bad person. I'm abandoning them. And for many of us, the idea that we would abandon someone, that we would let them fail, let them potentially perish, is not acceptable. But in the midst of it, what we're doing is we're killing ourselves. We're killing ourselves figuratively or actually literally in some cases. And so can we see that by putting the oxygen mask on ourselves, by choosing to leave them with the safety flotation device, loving them, offering them the safety, not being aggressive and leaving them to die, but saying, here is a safety. You have the opportunity to heal. You have the opportunity to choose to be happy. You have the opportunity to choose what kind of life you want. But I have to take care of myself. I have to be the one that can model that behavior that I'm going to choose for myself a happier, healthier life, that I'm going to do a spiritual practice in my life that I'm going to heal my inner wounds, that I'm going to stop acting out in a way that is around needing you to be a certain way for me to be a certain way, that I'm going to model how to be healthy and happy. I'm going to choose to be happy even when the people around me aren't happy. I'm going to choose my life. And hopefully in doing that, it gives the opportunity for those people in our life around us to have permission to make those same choices. As a spiritual coach, I can support you on your path to make deep and real changes that will bring you a life of peace, happiness, connection, and abundance. Visit the website recoveryoursoul.net to book coaching sessions, read the blog, listen to some of my original music, and subscribe to receive email updates. I think of Recover Your Soul as a community. Follow us on social media, join the private Facebook group, and even our monthly soul recovery support group on Zoom to support each other and connect. For an extra episode each week, become a Patreon member or subscribe on Apple Podcasts. If these episodes are helping you in any way and you want to donate, you want to really figure out how can I support this community and recover your soul, please look at the show notes below. There is a link to be able to donate monthly three, five, eight, or ten dollars. This cost of a fancy cup of coffee would really help support this community and recover your soul. Together, we can do the work that will recover your soul. So ultimately, it isn't selfish to choose ourselves. And in my situation, when I turned the attention to myself and I stopped needing or wanting to force Rich or Alex or Bodhi for that matter into this fantasy of us all having to do everything together, right? You have someone in your house who needs to eat better. And so then the whole family has to go into whatever this person's eating plan is. Well, there's a big difference between being supportive and being helpful, which is very important, to help somebody to have their best success. Same if somebody is not consuming alcohol or not consuming pot or something like that. You know, the ideal scenario is that you support by not having that right in their face But it doesn't have to mean that the whole family is now on this plan with no exceptions, because ultimately that's control and classic codependent behavior. 
And so when I went into my recovery this time and started looking at what am I afraid to look at? What is the fear that I have that's underneath? What is my need and want to try to make things be different between my husband and my son? What is it that I want to be different with how Rich interacts with the world? What do I want to be different with how Bodhi is in the world? Underneath was my discomfort with somebody else being uncomfortable. That somewhere in it, I felt responsible for everybody else's happiness. And once I realized that, it was as if I could see clearly for the first time that that step one of admitting that we're powerless over anything outside of ourself and recognizing the desire to control people, places, and circumstances is causing me pain and suffering. Once I realized that I personally felt responsible for everybody else's stuff, I realized it was me, the lifeguard in a pool of people who were all floundering and frightened and scared. And I couldn't get to all those people, but I felt responsible for each and every one of them and their happiness and whether they're okay And when I could let that go, and I could allow each of them to have their own process and trust that they're being held, that they're being guided, that they're being directed by higher power in the same way that I was feeling that, I could see that that was the least selfish thing I'd ever done. It was the most empowering thing that I could do, which is to heal myself Learn how to be present in each of those situations and each of those relationships as my fullest, truest, most healthy person, that I could feel my feelings and not stuff them down, not project them out, not need somebody else to heal them for me, but to allow myself to to just be, to just be okay or not okay to allow them to be okay or not okay. And interestingly enough, the more that I let go of feeling like I was responsible for their being okay out there in the pool, the more they've learned to swim, the more they've learned to take care of themselves, the more they're holding on to their flotation device and deciding for themselves how they're going to be. I had a situation just this last couple days with Alex that I just thought was so great because When we do this work and we start working the soul recovery process and our nervous system calms down so that we can have those little pauses when things are happening and utilize our tools and and check in with ourselves and see how we're feeling. What do we need? What's going on? Do I feel responsible? Do I feel like I need to control? You know, what do I feel like I'm supposed to be doing here What is my truth? How can I be my healthiest self in this situation? The boys being in California, I have to say that I totally understand that I have the gift right now of not having the chaos in my face all day, every day. And so for those of you who have the chaos in your life all day, every day, I just hold you so deeply in my heart and want you to know that I understand the complexity and to give yourself grace in the complexity of how it is to be in the chaos all the time. Alex called the other day and said that his roommates had let him know that they were going to not be renewing the lease when it comes up later this year and that they were going to go off and get an apartment or a house without him and that he was feeling really sad about that. And it's interesting because in the past, my old self would take on those emotions for him, would want to fix that for him, would want to take away the pain from him. We don't want our kids to be hurting. But what I did is I just listened. I asked a couple questions and I mostly tried to just hear him and let him know that I heard that that felt really sad and a little bit scary. And he just said, you know, I'm sorry to call you so late. Thanks for giving me some place to talk about it. And of course, my mind still wants to go through its old patterns of how do I fix this? 
But it was so beautiful because in this situation, I'm able to come back to the, I'm going to save myself. It is not my job to go out. He isn't drowning in this situation. He's actually just kind of informing because we're his parents and he's sharing his life with us and he's sharing what's going on with him. He didn't call and say, fix this for me. I'm in desperation. I'm despondent. He just was sharing his life. So I could notice those old parts of me that want to attach to the fix it. And then I did the soul recovery process of being kind to myself, knowing that it's hard to have him be uncomfortable, to trust and know that everything's working out, that there's always change and complexity, that he has the tools that he needs to work through this, that whether he lives with them or lives with somebody else, that he's a responsible adult, that he is going to be okay, that in the end, we're all learning and growing and there's always something happening. And I was able to sleep that night and woke up in the morning and sent him just a check in, you know, hope you have a good day text. And he called me back and said, Hey, I'm sorry for calling you so late last night. I just want to let you know, I talked to the guys a little bit, a little more clarity about what's going on. And I was able to take responsibility and see that I haven't been a great roommate. I'm kind of a messy roommate and I can understand why they wouldn't want to live with me. And then he was able to talk about how he went through his own healing process, his own soul recovery process of realizing how much fear that was for him to feel like he was being kicked out of the group and to understand that that wasn't necessarily the case. The case was really that they don't like living with him as a messy person. And he also said, you know, what I realize is I need to be better at living with people. And this has been real eye-opening for me, a real learning experience. And he's like, but everything's fine. It's all going to work out. And I have plenty of time to find a place. And thanks for being there for me. And I just thought, man, if we come so far from the years where he would just call in panic, and then I would immediately jump to fixing it, and then I would jump to blaming whoever made him feel sad, and all of the drama and all of the energy that came from that. But what I loved about that situation is that each person had the opportunity to do their own work, and that I especially was really conscientious of taking care of myself and my emotions and contemplating what it was about and processing for myself and being okay, even if he wasn't okay. It's okay to take care of yourself. It's important to take care of yourself. You can love the people around you. You can be supportive of the people around you, but it doesn't mean that you have to be drowning in the pool with them. It means that you can set them up in a way that offers support, but you let them have their consequences. You let them have their learning experience. And just lastly, I'm sure I'll poke this in some other episode along the way. I've been thinking a lot in reading all of the Facebook posts, not only in the Soul Recovery community page, but in all the other recovery pages that I subscribe to, that there's this energy about the responsibility of not leaving somebody who's struggling in their addiction. I keep thinking about how when I was in the rooms of AA, there was this one meeting that I went to that had a lot of young people. And it was a meeting where recovery centers brought people in from the treatment center to come to this particular meeting. So there was a lot of people from treatment centers, but there was a lot of younger people in particular. And what really affected me was hearing the number of people say, and especially I'm just going to say in this situation, it was, it was men, both younger men and all ages, who really would talk about how they couldn't really do recovery on their own until they were put in a position where they were responsible 100% for their recovery. And I think a lot about this one young man that talked about how his mom 
continue to save him and help him and save him and help him. And he had overdosed a couple times. And at one point she just said, I've got to save myself and I want you to be okay. But at this point in my life, this isn't working for me anymore. And you're going to have to find another place to live. And we're not going to financially help you anymore. And he said, interestingly enough, that was the moment where he realized that he had to save himself, that she handed him that flotation device and got out of the pool. And it's been a long, rocky road for him. He's had moments of really great sobriety and real clarity, and he's relapsed a couple times still. His journey with addiction is a tough one. But what ended up happening was that he realized in that moment that regardless of what he had in his life, he had to choose. He had to choose. He had to do it. And he let his parents off the hook of needing them to save him. And that stuck with me so much. And those stories similar to that in the rooms about what is it that gets somebody to finally actually step into recovery? And the truth is some people never step into recovery. Some people never really are willing to admit that it's a problem. But we choose We choose if we're going to be in the pool with them, with our heads being pushed underwater. That's our decision. And it isn't selfish to pick you. Until next time, namaste. Are you wondering, how do I go deeper on my soul recovery journey? Or how do I support this great podcast? Well, here's your call to action. If you're ready for real interchange and would like to work directly with me, visit the website and book a coaching session. I'm here to support you on your unique path. I'm here to help you let go of the past, to deepen your connection with higher power, whatever that is for you, and then to discover and step into a happy and healthy life of your making. You can also become part of the Soul Recovery community. One way is to join the support group. It's the first Monday of every month. It's on Zoom from 6 to 7 p.m. Mountain Time, and you can register on the website and get your Zoom link. It's the same link every month. We are also on social media. Of course, there's Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, and now even Insight Timer. Yes, lots of ways to connect. There is even a private Facebook group that will allow you for more communication and conversation about soul recovery with your community. If you'd like an extra bonus episode every Friday, you can become an Apple Podcast subscriber or choose your tier level of giving on Patreon. I'd also love all the listeners to subscribe on the website so that I can keep you informed on what's going on with the podcast, the community, with me, and anything that's up and coming and new and great about soul recovery. Also, if you just take a little bit of time and give me five stars, a quick review, share the podcast with friends and family, make sure you're subscribing however you listen to the podcast. We're helping even more people to have soul recovery in their lives. If this podcast is providing you spiritual nourishment and inspiration, thank you, thank you, thank you for going to the website, pushing the donate button, and giving whatever feels right to you. It means so much to me because I have this mission of sharing soul recovery with the world and your donations, your bookings, your subscriptions, everything that you do to be part of this community is making all that happen. Together, we can do the work that will recover your soul.